So as I said, I think many of you are familiar with, with Mary Beth's project, 2019 project, Seeing Noonan, which was installed in Noonan, Georgia. It, of course, garnered national attention in outlets, including the New York Times. There was a very big article. Um, and as you all know, I hope that installation stimulated very powerful conversations and connections, both locally and, and beyond. As I said, that is happening here at Watson as well, here at Brown as well. It's just fabulous. Uh, Mary Beth, fortunately for us, will be the fit artist in residence at Brown from October 18th through October 29th. So I know Mary Beth already has a very full schedule during that time, but please, please, if you want to be in touch with her, invite her to uh, visit your class or give a talk, just get in contact with Sarah Baldwin, whom I'll introduce in just a moment. Uh, now let me turn briefly to our other distinguished guest, Fred Turner. And Fred, I'm not sure whether you would remember, but we know each other from many years ago at MIT. Fred was a wonderful- I do. When I was just starting my academic career back at, at MIT. Fred is a 1984 graduate of Brown. Yay. Um, and he is currently the Harry and Norman Chandler Professor of Communication and the Akiko Yamazaki and Jerry Young University Fellow in Undergraduate Education at Stanford University. Fred's had a very distinguished career, continues to have a very distinguished career, uh, uh, and his research and teaching focus on media technology and cultural change, especially the ways in which emerging media have helped shape American life really since World War II. In addition to seeing Silicon Valley, which he produced in collaboration with Mary Beth, and the rise of digital utopia, utopianism, and echoes of combat, the Vietnam War in American memory. So we're going to conduct today's event in a, in a discussion format, a kind of an informal interview format with Mary Beth and Fred online in conversation with our own Sarah Baldwin. Uh, Sarah is not just a wonderful writer in her own right and a key member of our communication staff, but she's also um, has been and continues to be a key player on the Art at Watson committee. And I, I want to say a special thanks to that entire committee really for being the leaders and drivers of, of, um, of our getting Mary Beth, Mary Beth and, her, and her phenomenal installation here. So uh, the conversation that Sarah will, will, will manage and lead will happen for about 30 minutes or so. And then we're gonna turn it over to you all for questions and answers. And when I say you all, I mean those of you here physically in the audience and when you have questions, I, I would ask you to come up to the microphones to state them. And I also am referring to the online audience. So for those of you who have questions or comments, feel free to write them in the comments uh, on YouTube and our staff will, will get those questions to uh, Mary Beth and Fred and Sarah. So with that, let me turn it over to you, Sarah. Thank you and welcome to our guests. Uh, hi, hi. Fred, he's here. I'm here. Hello. Good to see you guys. Welcome. Hello. Thanks. Super nice to be here. And apologies to the audience for transcontinental tele telecommunication. <laughs> He's kind of loud. <laughs> <laughs> it's great to have you. It's great to have you. He's louder than us now. Oh, it feels good to be loud. Thank you. <laughs> oh, God. Well, now that we're all together, I thought we might just probably start with a question that um, a lot of us probably have who don't know you so well. Um, how did the two of you come together? What is the, the genesis story of this project? That's for you to answer, Fred. Is that me? Okay. Um, so first, hi, everybody. And thank you, Ed. And thank you, Sarah. And thank you, Mary Beth, um, for having me here. I feel really excited to be here. Um, I'm a Brown grad and haven't been back to campus in a while. And this is a pretty nice way to do it. Um, Mary Beth, am I okay? Am I not too loud? You're kind of loud, but it's okay. Okay, I'll, I like I'll, it. It's I'll, fine. I'll, it's fine. Okay. It's good. I'll come no, back from come the, on. It's good. I'll, I'll step back from the mic a little bit. Fine. I'm just playing with you. Okay. <laughs> so as the audience will quickly discover, Mary Beth and I have a pretty good working relationship. Um, yeah, so I don't know, about three and a half years ago, I had been living in Silicon Valley for almost 20 years. I've been writing academically about the valley. And the valley that I was writing about was a myth. It was a story of, of you know, um, Elon Musk and Steve Jobs and these sort of young, mostly white, mostly male inventors who had these computers just springing out of their minds with genius. And that wasn't the world I inhabited at all. You know, I, I, I live in a, I live two miles from Google's headquarters. 
Um, in my office at Stanford, where I'm sitting right now, I'm 100 yards away from the building in which the first algorithms were written. But the world I live in out here is a world that is radically diverse, radically unequal, and just filled with lots of different kinds of people living many different kinds of ways. And so something that I very much wanted to do was to visualize this world, to make the actual world that's here available to people who, who weren't here. You know, this has been such a city on a hill in the American imagination and the global imagination for decades now. I thought we needed to step back and just sort of ask, well, what kind of city are we actually building here? And I was very lucky to be paired up with, with Mary Beth, a friend of ours introduced us. And I think, Mary Beth, you can speak to this. I think you were maybe a little bit skeptical. Who's this weird guy on the West Coast who, you know, wants me to come out? I saw Mary Beth's Brockton work, and I, would, I just thought, this is amazing. This is what we need. And I can say why in a bit, but that's how we got together, isn't it? Yeah, I got this phone call out of the blue from an old colleague who said, um, there's a professor here who's really into your work. And would you? And he's doing a book on Sil he wants to do a project on Silicon Valley, really seeing Silicon Valley for what it is on the ground. And you know, my first thought was Silicon Valley. I mean, I'm as I was as kind of blinded by the myth as anyone, and thought, what on earth could I contribute to a conversation about Silicon Valley? So Fred and I started having these phone calls, and he started sending me books. And I went out uh, to visit him in the summer. We we met for a week and um, just to see if we thought we could work together. And it was kind of like, you know, fireworks right away. We just really got into this idea of photography as a medium, to collaborative photography as a medium through which to kind of try to see the place for what it was. And um, and that was it. Yeah, I, I do want to ask you both about that. Fred, you're a you're from the Northeast, but you've lived there for 20 years. Mm -hmm. You are. It was all new to you. You had the story in your head, the story that Silicon Valley tells about itself, I think, probably right. like most of us do. But in the book, in your essay, in the book, you talk about this palpable unease, which is not what I expected mm. to hear. And you talk about this anxiety. So I wonder if each of you could take turns. Um, you saying how it felt to live there for six weeks right and you fred maybe how has it changed over 20 years mm -hmm. well you know the first so that first trip was in the summer of 2017 and i i rented an airbnb as close as i could to fred's house and there was a woman named erfan for example who was the owner of the house and she and i were emailing back and forth and you know, I brought, I had brought my camera on that trip, not even knowing if I would do the residency, but she and I were emailing back and forth. And I thought, let me just get my feet wet. Let me just write to her on this Airbnb text and say, could I talk to you? I'm doing this work about Silicon Valley. Could I make your picture? And she said, sure. So we made this appointment the next day. I hadn't even met her just by, you know, by Airbnb. And so I went around to the front of the house and the next morning and she opened the door and her portrait is out here in the lobby. And she said, come in, I wanna tell you all about what it's like here. All of my relatives in Iran think that we are rich and that this is easy street and they have no idea how much we're struggling and they have no idea how competitive it is and how much unease I feel. And you know that the existential cost of being in this economy is so high and people don't see it who aren't here in the region. And yet I don't wanna seem ungrateful to my family back in Iran mm -hmm. who, know, who, who also sacrificed for me to get here. So, I mean, just right off the bat and her husband worked at Google, I guess I should have said that. I went to Fred's house and said, well, I already made the first portrait. I mean, it's, it's, it's right <laughs> there. You know, all you have to do is ask people what it feels like here and they'll tell you. And he said, she, she said that to you? And her husband works at Google. So, and it was just kind of like that. People just wanted to, to share it. I think they kind of labor under that feeling too, that the streets are not paved with gold, even though the rest of the world um, sort of thinks that they are. And so it was just like, and then I went back in October and it was just one person after another who wanted to share this idea that the story that the world was getting was not what it was like. Well, the yeah. sense that um, we get from your writings, both of you in this book, is a, a sense of incredible precarity. And not just people who are working and struggling and not making a decent living, but people who are making a decent living as well. And that was a huge surprise for me. Fred, can you tell us about your experience in Silicon Valley? Absolutely. So, so you know, I had been here about 20 years and I've watched the place boom. I arrived at the tail end of the last boom in the late 90s. And I've been here since uh, the social media boom. And I watched Google's headquarters get built. I watched Facebook's headquarters get built. And I watched housing prices skyrocket around that. 
but you know, I inhabit a pretty insulated bubble. I, I, I mean, I'm on a pretty fancy campus and I see things around me, but not in an engaged kind of way. And one of the great things about having Mary Beth here was that she brought a New England vision with her, a kind of Brockton vision of economic change and the ways that our bodies kind of live inside those changes. And as she got here, I started to see new things. That anxiety for me was just sort of in the water. Like, of course, we're all hustling. I mean, Silicon Valley feels like the fastest place I know, except maybe New York. You know, people are always hustling. And to see that from the outside and to see people in their bodies feeling that hustle was was really pretty powerful. I, th I thought it's thought quite effective. Well, it definitely comes through in the book. And, and I, you know, I approached this book as an object of words and images, but it's also a, a book of voices, which mm. I really appreciate because it's third person, but you really give voice to these people who might not otherwise be heard in the, in the dominant narrative. And I thought maybe, could you just read a little bit? This is about Mary, who's not in our show, but um, mm -hmm. I find that the, the sort of brevity is all the more powerful. Sure. Um, so just the um, yeah, underlined think, lines. Yeah. Okay. There are people here who are poorer than we are in Africa because you cannot find a homeless person in my village. And because our community cares for each other, because we live according to clans, when you have a problem, someone is going to come and at least try and solve your problem if it can be solved. In Africa says, Mary, you're never alone. This place is lonely. I even wanted to go back last year. It is lonely, lonely. That Mary's from Uganda. Yeah, thank you. And that I thought was particularly striking. It's not a, it's not a, uh, an emotion that people talk about. Um, you know, it's not. Oh, I can't afford a Tesla. It's profound dislocation and 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 unconnection or disconnection. I think. Sarah. I, yes. So I feel like the great looming voice on the wall. Sorry ahead, about you that. You are. But yeah, I, I I wanted to just jump in and 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 say that the kind of loneliness that Mary Beth made visible in these stories is characteristic of an information-driven economy. One of the deepest fantasies out here is that we can take the lived world and turn it into information. And that expressing ourselves and building community depends only on being able to turn our voices into digits that can then circulate in digital systems. And one of the things that I love about Mary Beth's work and that I think we tried hard to do in the book was put voices back in the bodies of the people who speak them and build community, show how community really lives in bodies. And that when you turn things into information, you erase or make, uh, make hard to see right. the kinds of people on whom community actually depends. That's a good point. Well, I wonder, um, and this is for both of you, do you think Silicon Valley is kind of a fun house mirror that's distorting hmm. things um, as it's, as it faces the rest of American society, or do you think it's a pretty accurate mirror of the rest of American society or American society as a whole? Um, well, we, we, so Fred and I, you know, I would go out and do my work and then every week we'd have dinner in his backyard. Um, we'd have dinner and then get some wine and talk in his backyard. And we had all these <laughs> charts about, you know, what was I seeing and what, and how did it work? And was it a pyramid and Zuckerberg's on the top or is it a sphere and Zuckerberg's in the middle and how to, you know, how do we think about this ecosystem that is Silicon Valley? And what I think we both came to, tell me if I don't want to speak for Fred, but what I think we both kind of came to is that it really is sort of where the country's headed, at least economically, and then in terms of the, of the drive to keep advancing technologically and keep uh, sort of uplifting, uh, uploading all of our relationships online. Would you say that's true, Fred? So, so the I, I would, inequalities that we feel in the country, are, it's like end game. It's sort of like yeah. the, the, the end game of where we're all headed. Yeah, I, I very much agree with that. I don't think it's a funhouse mirror. I think it's an, apothe an apotheosis. Um, and I, I, I think the, the fantasy is that like, you know, the original pilgrim communities of the 1620s, people can come here and magically um, create this kind of new world in which everything just happens sort of magically. It's easy, it's clean. And if you come here, it looks clean, beautiful sky, green yeah. land, but Santa Clara County, one of the two counties that makes up Silicon Valley is the single most polluted county in America. We have more Superfund sites in this county than any other county in America. We have 74, billion, 74, 74 billionaires in Silicon Valley right now. 
and yet a little more than one fifth of the population is food insecure. One in five families can't have enough to eat in a, in a region where we have 70 plus billionaires. That's just flat wrong. But that kind of inequality, I think, is an inequality that's spreading throughout the country. The particular piece that the information industry owns is that they sold us the fantasy that when we could, could interconnect using digital technologies, we would finally achieve the kind of individual centered community that we all craved. But what's actually happening is a kind of parasitic building out and informationalizing of everyday life in a way that produces grotesque inequalities. And these are not just produced in Silicon Valley, they're being produced around our country and around our world. Is that, would you say that's what makes, because there are other very, very, um, there are other cities that are incredibly unequal, mm -hmm. um, you know, vast wealth and, and, and really abject poverty. Is that information piece, that, that digital technology piece, what makes Sil Silicon Valley kind of a special case in a way, uh, and almost more dystopian? I yeah, so I, do, I, sorry, go ahead. Mary, Mary Beth, no, go ahead, go ahead, Mary Beth. I'll come back in well, a minute. I think also there has to, it has to do with geography too. I mean, everybody's in their cars all the time in Silicon Valley. So people who have the means can purchase it, it, either through their Tesla or through their technology, purchase a kind of insulation mm -hmm. from the parts of the community with which they don't want to interact. So there's no kind of, I get to know the guy at the, at the place where I get my coffee. That, I mean, I had never heard of people having groceries delivered until COVID. But I mean, that kind of thing happens all the time in Silicon Valley. So there's this whole just buying out of the kinds of human interactions that make communities thrive. Yeah, Would you I say? really agree with, I agree with that. And I think that that buying out depends on a, on a mythology that is deeply American. And the mythology, the fantasy is that there's a sort of an invisible order to the world. There are special people in that order who can access it, make use of it and do it. And they plug into that order through their computers, through network systems. And when they do, they are no longer responsible to the rest of us because building the systems is itself a semi-divine act. And, and that's how people think. Many people think out here. I know it sounds wacky. Of course, I'm saying it in Roger Williams, Rhode Island, right? But, 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 even, but it, so it does sound a little bit wacky, but it, but it is actually how folks think. And if you're one of those folks, you don't have to necessarily notice the kinds of people that Mary Beth has made pictures of. And I think that's a, that's a real problem and characteristic of a style of seeing one another that has permeated our society um, in the last 50 years and is a real problem. I think too, just to, um, I, I think it's important to know that the book is not just about inequality, it's about right. unease. And it's about a, 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 an, an economy on the ground that could be making life easier for people, people right. across the economic spectrum. And in fact, it's making life harder for people. So the people who are in the pictures on the buildings, you know, we, Sarah and I worked for a long time to edit, which, which would be the most representative pictures to, to have as banners. You know, so there's Mark, whose mother worked in technology early on, who was working with lead and who after miscarriage had a child who had developmental disabilities because of what she was working in the early technology industry. And, you know, to, to Fred's point about the pollution, there's, um, you know, richer, I mean, so all those pictures get at different angles into the unease that people are feeling. It's not Mary Beth, just would you, the poverty. Would you like me to show those pictures? I can just pull them right up. Well, is yeah, that, that a good idea? Yeah, that was my next is um, that, question, because I know we'd love to see the pictures. The and just really quickly, just tell us what your day was like. What was your method? How did you find <laughs> these people? And how did you spend time with them, get them to talk? And well, then we sometimes, can sometimes, so I rented an Airbnb in Menlo Park. I had this little black rental car. And sometimes it was literally like get in the rental car at 7 a.m. and drive until some, okay, this sounds a little kooky, <laughs> but drive until something says stop, <laughs> some like gut thing or something happens. I believe a lot in serendipity because it just, you know, the world is such a rich place. And as soon as we engage it, it starts, it starts showing up for us, you know? So sometimes it was just drive and meet a stranger and end up back at their house with them. Sometimes it was working. So first of all, I was working a lot with an organization um, that was working for workers' rights. So first of all, I was working security at Facebook full time uh, through, uh, uh, um, Fred, what do you call those? 
those uh, uh, through a, a contractor, an outsourced contractor. A contractor. Yeah. So he's hired by a contractor, uh, and he's working full time at Facebook. But look where he's living. So I met him. So you didn't this. know that, right? I didn't know that. So I was given his phone number. I called him up. Yes, he wanted to work with me. He gave me the address. I met him at the address. He meets me at the front of the house, and he brings me back to this shed, which is where he was sleeping because he couldn't afford a house in Silicon Valley. Okay, who else? I mean, if we go through them sort of quickly, Ravi and Gutami, um, you know, so, so part of it is the serendipity and walking the streets. Part of it is doing a lot of research. There was a large Hindu community, a large community from India that started when engineers from India started showing up in Silicon Valley in the 80s. Um, started to build a real community of, of people from India with advanced degrees who started working in um, engineering. And so I met them at the temple. So I would go to the temple or I would go to all these different places. I would, I would figure out kind of who is, this, who is this community? Who is this ecosystem? And I knew that this was an important facet to the whole Silicon Valley, uh, Silicon Valley world. So I hung out at the temple for a long time and I met Gutami, and I and then I explained my project. And I'm Mary Beth Mia. I'm doing this project with Fred Turner. We're at Stanford. We're looking at Silicon Valley, and so we met, and they were interested in doing a photograph together. And this is at a park um, near their house in Foster City. And what you know, what they said is they've got like five degrees between the two of them, and they're having a hard time. I think like a one bedroom apartment, something like three thousand dollars where they live, and you know they want to have a family. So how does quality of life? Um, how do economics have an impact on, on quality of life and what does that mean? Here's John who grew up in East Palo Alto who really wanted to talk about how children who grow up in neighborhoods, not Palo Alto, but East Palo Alto, um, don't have access to these corporations that are right there. So these buildings are right there in their communities and these kids don't, the school system that they're working through do not provide um, entry to these corporations. So this is in the marshy area where he walks his dog. It's right near um, where he lives. And he wanted to make this portrait to, to talk about that. And, and what he did was instead of continuing to strive as an engineer himself, he decided to get off that path and stay in East Palo Alto and start to train young students in, um, with using maker spaces and other initiatives to get them into um, higher ed in, in um, engineering. Here's Justina, who's a, an AI engineer from Poland. The funniest thing happened. So Fred and I did this book and we had it published in France and we, 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 sh we really shopped it to American publishers. Like every publisher you can think of re rejected us. And we got it published in France because the French somehow got it. And what they said was, this is in Silicon Valley. And, and so Fred and I talked a lot about this portrait of Justina. You know, she's a woman, she's in Cupertino, she lives in a mansion. But what she wanted to talk to me about was the values that she learned growing up in Poland and this idea of being good to one another. And she developed, um, she was using her AI specialty to develop disaster response. So let's say there's a flood. Let's send robots in <laughs> to pull the people out of the flood. And you know, let's use it to let's use AI to save human lives. And she gets to Silicon Valley. She gets all the way from Poland to Silicon Valley and realizes there's no money in this. This is a capitalistic model. You can get, you can make money, you know, developing an app that'll make you like wink and have little stars, but you can't make money for disaster response because there's no one's gonna buy, no one's gonna pay for it. So she went into um, oh, Fred's going fast. That means I'm talking too long. Okay, here's Constance, um, who's on the other side of. Is it benevolent or Charles Field? Constance is oh, a teacher. Yeah, Charles Field. Yep. Um, and she, you know, this portrait was not in the French book, but I went back to make this portrait because I felt that this idea of a public, a public servant, a teacher, firefighter, um, police, per, a police officer, uh, can't afford to live in the town that they that they serve. And so Constance was driving two hours each way to be a teacher in Menlo Park, and then Facebook. Um, started this kind of subsidized housing. So what happens when, like, how do you quantify economically or in any kind of way, holistically, what, why does it matter to a community that your police and fire and teachers can't afford to live there? What relationships don't get built because Constance's kids aren't playing with the kids that she teaches, et cetera, and on and on. That's not, I mean, you can roll that out indefinitely. And how do you, how do you quantify that? And I wanna, can I jump in here and, and, yeah. and, and say that, you know, 
as we talk, Mary Beth, one of the things that I love that you brought to the project and that's obviously in the pictures is that is the is the way of thinking about relationships that you just named. Because in the tech world, a relationship is a digital connection. You know, Mark Zuckerberg uses the word of uh, connect a lot. We're going to connect. We're going to connect. But this kind of connectionism in the tech world is exactly the opposite of the kind of um, relational embodied community building across difference on which actual healthy communities depend. And your portraits so wonderfully captured that relationship in part because you built miniatures of that relationship with each of the people that you made images of. Well, thank you for saying it. Thank you for seeing it that way. Um, speaking of firefighters, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about your experience oh. um, and how different that is from what kind of people you Well, you know, I grew up in Brockton, Mass, which is a post, it's like growing up in Pawtucket. It's a post industrial, it was a shoe factory town. And um, although you are Brown students, so I don't know if you all know what Pawtucket is, probably. Uh, well, no, I don't mean that in any funny way, but they're busy doing their work here. Why would they hang out in Pawtucket? Um, so Brockton was a shoe factory town. And when I was growing up, you know, I knew that the shoe factories were closing, but it was a place where, you know, I come from Italian and Irish immigrants. My grandfather was an Italian immigrant. All of them did unskilled labor. Uh, he didn't speak English. He did very well for himself. And my parents were solidly working class. My father was a fireman. My mother was a bookkeeper. I went off to a fancy, you know, private college and I live this lovely life now. They lived a lovely life too. And the, and the point was that when you were an immigrant, those factories provided a kind of job security and also a kind of community. I mean, the, the, there's a, there was an Italian neighborhood where one of the shoe factories was where, you know, you, you all spoke Italian, you went to your job and you spoke Italian together and all your shops and your butcher and everything. I mean, it sounds so quaint. It sounds like Mr. Rogers neighborhood, but you know, you went to the church together, you went to the butcher, you went home, your kids knew one another. And so those shoe factories provided a kind of living. And, and this is, I start spinning off into this whole Fred and I, Fred's like, don't talk about neoliberalism. <laughs> but I mean, this kind of economic theory where the shareholder was not the priority. I mean, there were different priorities, but people got enough of the pie as Richard, who's up on the tower talked about, we just want enough of the pie that we can have a healthy life. I went to Silicon Valley, never dreaming that my background in Brockton would inform what I found there. I, I felt like they were, couldn't be, it didn't even occur to me that being from Brockton would have any influence on how I saw it. But what I realized was my grandmother, would she, were she to show up in Silicon Valley in 2021, she would be living in a one bedroom apartment with two other Italian families. And how would they get out of that? My grandfather would never have been able to start a business. The equivalent, I mean, my grandfather was ambitious and, and, and wily, but I mean, he would have been one of those guys on the side of the road, hoping that someone would pick him up for work for, you know, $18 an hour. So if, if that, and, you know, just let's not forget what we're talking, we're talking about Silicon Valley, where that money's being generated, all the wealth that Google and Facebook is generating off of everything that we're putting up there every day, all that wealth, 74 billionaires, and there's more poverty in that, in, in that, in those square miles than, than anywhere else in the country. I, I mean, at least relatively speaking to the wealth that's there. What do you think, Fred? Is that an overstatement? I, I, no, I think, it's, I think it's pretty fair. And I think that the, the key point here is that, and this is where we disagree a little bit. I don't think it's a shareholder issue. I think it's a straight up greed issue. You know, Facebook is a public company nominally, but it actually has a two tier stock structure such that Mark Zuckerberg retains 51% of control at all times. And so it is ultimately a kingdom of one. And you know the stock structures out here are, are carefully arranged to make, to concentrate power in the hands of a few people, and we sometimes blame the the fact that a company is public for its fiduciary obligation to create wealth for the company. That's not the case. On the contrary, Even I think worse. sometimes, pardon. Even worse than that. Yeah, I, I, much worse than that. And I think I think that's that's a challenge. I think the other thing, right, is is what we're not. One thing we're not talking about that's not so much in our book, but I think is important, is the role of the state potentially in sustaining the kinds of community that we want and in reining in the kind of greed that we see. In some ways, Silicon Valley looks to me like an oil town in the 20s. You know, it, it looks like Carnegie country or Rockefeller country. We had to break up the trusts. We had to build a different kind of society. Those, those oil barons polluted our landscape. 
Today's social media barons are polluting our democracy. And the only vehicle that I see that we have that is strong enough to, to challenge that is in fact the state. And this is a challenge for those of us on the left who tend to believe that um, you know, individual expression and identity are the keys to freedom. They are important, but individual freedom and identity are also the keys to profit at Facebook. And if we're gonna challenge that, we need to challenge it with the kind of state institutions that those of us on the left have grown in the habit of challenging ourselves. Sorry, that was my big rant. I had to get that off my chest. Our collaboration? Yes. Sure. Peter is a scholar and a man of words and communication and who you are, this artist with the imagery and the, and the mission. What did you learn from each other? And what was, what, what enriched you about working with the other? You guys are looking at me, so should I start? Yeah. Doesn't matter, go ahead. Okay, I'll start. I, I learned a ton from Mary Beth. So um, I don't normally collaborate with folks. Uh, I'm a very solitary writer kind of guy. I'm an academic who spends a lot of time alone in a room with books. I do interview people. I was a journalist for 10 years. I wrote for the Providence Business News for 10 years. So I, you know, I, 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 do, I do love to talk with people, but I don't collaborate easily. And I did collaborate easily with Mary Beth and it was because it was so much fun. Also, um, we saw different things. I feel like I saw structure pretty well, like social structure, the sort of sociological piece. And Mary Beth kept reminding me to humanize that and to see the people. And then just because you were coming from Brockton and you had your you had the particular background and, and sort of work that you've done so far, you saw race and class in a way that I sort of had sort of grown, grown a little bit numb to. And, and I thought that was also super powerful. Um, I also, I think, I, honestly, the thing that I really learned the most from Mary Beth was was to trust right to like to trust and to just you know let go a little bit and <laughs> you guys have no idea <laughs> <laughs> all right i think that's probably a good place for me to hold no, Mary Beth. I'm joking. you'd like to I'm jump joking. in there. that's fine you jump in you go no i'm joking it makes it does make me <laughs> laugh that poor old brockton keeps coming up i mean i can't believe it that poor old brockton keeps coming up but you know, it was so wonderful to work with Fred. And let me tell you, this is one of the big rants I have about photography, fine art photography, photojournalism, you know, white people doing this work, is that we're out there photographing people and we don't know what we're looking at. And we're putting it through our very skewed lens all the time. We don't know what we're seeing. And I think collaborating with someone who has done so much work to really understand what's happening in Silicon Valley from that top, tier, you know, from that 35,000 foot view to say, these are the systems, these are the systems, the invisible systems. We've been talking about this for, you know, the past year intensively, but the invisible systems that are keeping people unequal, that are keeping people segregated, that are keeping people disconnected and alienated from one another. Fred knows all that stuff about Silicon Valley. So I'm there meeting Imelda and Erfan and John, and then we're having dinner and I'm, I'm saying, my sense is that X, and he's saying, well, of course, because Y. And he can talk about how we got to today from you know 1980. So I think that there's so much journalism and art and visual production and, and just sort of media production that doesn't really know what it's looking at, doesn't really know what it's seeing. And I think we were able to, we were able to, you know, bounce, bounce off each other. I mean, I there's still two white people in that room. So there are liabilities, but I mean, I think, you know, we, we tried really hard to, um, we tried really hard to be thorough and it was fun. And Fred is a, a good guy who can take it on the chin if you have something you have to Oh, tell. absolutely. And, and, <laughs> and, you know, and, and, and definitely did. Um, I wanted to say Mary Beth the same the, in a good way. I mean, Mary, Mary Beth taught me a lot and I, I'm, I'm grateful well, for it. And my, my, my daughter still thinks the best thing that ever happened to me as a, as a person in the world was meeting Mary Beth. And so it's like my daughter likes to say, she trained right. you, daddy. You know, it was good. But, 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 but what I wanted to say also was that um, it's as important for those of us who work in the social sciences and in history to work with photographers as it is for photographers to work with us. There are things that come with seeing and with how you pay attention to the world that um, in some ways kind of get trained out of you when you're, a, when you're a, a book writing social scientist. 
and if you can partner with someone who whose skill set and and being is focused in that way, you learn a lot, and you're able to make something like this book, which I think um, speaks to people in a very different way than a more traditional sociological analysis would. And and I'm amazed at how much this book has has reached a really different world and reached much farther in lots of ways than than some of my academic work. And I think that's wonderful. Oh, absolutely. For so, Thea Lang and Paul Taylor, Walker Evans and James Agee. Who else? <laughs> Who Just else? The, Langston Hughes and Roy DeCarva. I, 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 I'm loving the examples. I don't you know, feel like Fred I live up. Is a, he's a real lover of photography, too. That's the other thing. And um, he, when I went back to photograph Constance in, in 2019 and photograph a few other people, I was in his house. He, they, he and his wife were away. And it was like the most amazing artist residency because he has walls and walls of amazing photo books. So he already was had his had a good right brain going for for photography. I want to self take you back to your questions, um, but I would like to also invite um, our, our audience to come to the mic if you have a question to say a little bit about who you are and who the question is for. And um, don't be shy, because I have another question before you get brave. Let me ask you this. Okay. Okay, sure. Thanks. Um, speaking of humanizing um, these images and these, these stats, uh, how are you Oh, this is for me. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> you thought you had to do I the mic job? You thought yeah, you I thought the mic I was going to be like... <laughs> Right. Um, you are in touch still with the people, your subjects, and um, I know that when we were doing the installation, you showed Richard, the Tesla guy, the big guy, yeah, um, and Constance and, and Justina. What has been their reaction? What is it like for them to be 40 feet high on the walls of Brown University? Well, Richard, uh, so Richard, who's on the tower, you know, he worked in the auto industry and was making, you know, $140,000 a year. He's at the plant. Tesla buys the plant. He goes into work and he gets a job for 18 hours, for $18 an hour, 40 something thousand a year. This is like emblematic of the American economy. Like that story is it right, right there. He starts to help form a union and he gets fired. And he's in the news. You can Google him, Richard Ortiz. He he, the, 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 the federal government has found in his favor against Elon Musk over and over again that he was unlawfully fired and that Elon Musk owes him back pay. And, he, and what he said to me on the phone was, you know, he works for 10 minutes to pay my back pay for all these years I've been off, off work. But Elon Musk keeps appealing it and appealing it and appealing it. Why? Because he wants to send a message to the workers that if they try to form a union, they'll get in trouble. And he also wants to tire out, in Richard's idea, he wants to tire out the workers that Richard worked with. I mean, you have to build up momentum with workers to, to form a, a union. By keeping Richard away from them, their momentum is gone. So Richard said, I think this was God's doing. <laughs> That, that that he's up on the that he's up on the tower and that this means that he's going to finally win his thing with 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 i mean you know john is john is really excited cristobal is really excited he said he wants to come to brown and do a meet and greet <laughs> cristobal by the bike rack ravi and gotami were a little shy they were a little shy about being on the wall and it took them a while it took them a while to get you very bad i understand that yes can I jump in? I mean, you yeah. use the G, you use the G word. So I want to just talk about something the else. Word? The God word. Um, oh. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. The, the, Sorry. The, I, I know it's a buzzkill. No, but it's important because from, from where I sit, right? I mean, if Silicon Valley is meant to be the new city on a hill, to see these portraits blown up large at Brown University in Roger Williams, Rhode Island, in the center of New England Puritan dreams of cities on a hill, at a university that has trained people to be leaders in a city on a hill forever and ever is really extraordinary. You know, I, I was saying to Sarah earlier that you know we don't have the kind of red brick that you all have out there, and you have brought together the sort of Silicon Valley world and the New England world, and they are right there together on the wall. I think that's a really important American statement. Well, and my hope for this residency, really, in in in, in addition to 
learning from all of you when we get into the classrooms next week. But you know, during this time at Brown and the, all the time we spent at Stanford talking to different groups, I want everyone here to take their own discipline. We want everyone to take their own discipline and fix these problems. You know, not, this isn't about like training new photographers, although that's important too. But you know, everyone here at Watson who is, I'm so excited about the different ways in which we can slice this work through the environment, through economics, et cetera. But please take this ball and solve this problem. <laughs> Sarah. Thank you. Um, you must have plans to take this show to Silicon Valley as well, of course. Yes. Well, there's kind of no there there. Where would we where would we put it? Fred said we can't do it at Stanford, right, Fred? Yeah. So I, I'd like to say a little bit about that. Stanford <laughs> is because it, it has been a frustration for me. So so Stanford actually has a policy against large banners on its buildings. Um, the buildings at Stanford are trademarked, um, and hanging large the banners themselves. on the build. Yep, hanging hanging large banners on the buildings would, I believe, violate the trademark. Um, well, Mary Beth's work is enormously popular among my colleagues, which is really nice. And so uh, a small group of computer science professors is working with Matthew Tews, who's the head of our arts, who's the uh, head of our arts administration and many other things to actually make Mary Beth's portraits hang in the new computer science building that we're building as a reminder that when we make computers, we make them for and with people. And I, I, I'm, I'm really thrilled about that, that we can do. That building is not built yet. But, but they're it building is, it. It is, it it is, is exciting, nice. yes. Um, but that's not Silicon Valley. Well, that's Stanford. Sarah raises a good point that that's Stanford, right? I mean, that would be wonderful. I'm just making a joke about that building not being built. But I mean, where would we put it though? It's a good question. What is the there there? We can't, what is the there there in Silicon Valley? Is yeah, it look, town, Mountain View? No, let me, let, me, let me explain how the valley works just for a sec for folks who don't know it. So the valley is, is about 30 miles long and it's organized in clusters. Um, there's a dozen, more than a dozen different towns and the clusters are organized around different industrial hubs. So there's Yahoo, there's Google, there's Facebook, um, there's Salesforce, there's a series of other places. And there's no real center to the valley. That's what I mean. Not that there's no there there, but yeah, there's no real center. Although Teresa told me, Teresa, who's on the, on the cover of the book, who's at the, her daughter told me that, Fred, that there was an electronic billboard in Menlo Park and that the book was on the electronic billboard. Really? But I don't know what that was or who. Oh, that's thrilling. So maybe there is idea. a way to do it. Maybe we use technology to create the, to create the public commons. Yes. Mary Beth, this is a shift in focus. Um, but you, I know, have many very many brown connections and enormous number of connections as a teacher and i wonder if you would take a few minutes and talk a little bit about all the things that you've done in your children's school and mm -hmm. in local schools and how you've used your skills as a teacher well thank you eileen who was the head of arts lit way back in the day when we were working with schools all over Rhode Island. I mean, part of my practice has been to work as an educator with people who want to use photography to either tell their stories or tell their community stories or go and, and work in different ways. So I worked at the International Charter School for 11 years, with, which is a bilingual part, charter school here in Pawtucket where my kids went to school. And um, as part of the social studies curriculum, those kids got cameras and they went out and photographed their worlds and they made amazing, amazing work, partly uh, uh, supported in part by the Rhode Island Council for the Humanities and the Rhode Island Council for the Arts and, you know, this wonderful community that is Rhode Island in term, you know, in supporting each other and Brown Arts Lit. Um, and then, you know, I taught a master class at, uh, at Stanford and, you know, what I've been proud of in the last couple of years is there's a amazing, wonderful photographer, a good friend named Ruddy Roy. And Roddy and I taught a class with Social Documentary Network in over the last year in looking at how do we, how do we understand, you know, Ariella Azule, who's a scholar here at Brown, who I admire greatly and whose work has blown my mind and kind of rocked my world. You know, photography, we inherited our role as photographers from the sort of colonial project. I mean, it really, it, it really is an instrument of othering and in, it has been used in that way for, for you know, 
for since since its invention. And there are so many um, there are so many hangovers of that practice still in play in photojournalism, in journalism, in the art world. Um, you know, I'm sure there are strains of it in my work. Like we have been steeped in in those roles. And so one of the things that Ruddy and I have tried to do is really break that down and get photographers. Ariella call uh, one of the things she calls for is a strike you know, let's just go on strike. Let's not try to remake the world with the tools that we use to break it with. Um, and so what Reddy and I challenge our students and ourselves to do is kind of go on strike from photographing and figure out what does a responsible practice look like so that when, when we do you pick up that camera and we do represent something or someone other than ourselves, that that person feels as though we were a conduit toward a kind of truth and not just another misrepresentation. Oh boy, can I, Mary Beth, can I jump in on this? <laughs> yes, go ahead. Okay, you know I'm gonna disagree with some of this. Oh God, go ahead. That's okay. No, it's all good. It's all good. So, okay. you know, historically, of course, you're correct. Photography and colonialism have been entwined across the board. So that's, that's fine. about the family of man, watch. Yeah, you go watch. Ahead. I was gonna go there. Don't undercut me now as I'm getting underway okay, here. Sorry. Okay, go ahead, go ahead. That's all right. But, but photography can also be and has also been a tool for building intimacy and building connection across difference. And I think that's really important. And I think it's true in our book. I, I'll, I'll spare you the family of man, though, well, only for a moment. Put up in 1955, photographs from around the world and still the most widely seen photography exhibition of all time has never been down. From, from 1955 till now, it has been on constant display. Nine million copies of the catalog sold. And these are just pictures of people at different life stages, all different races, all different classes. There's something about being able to see, especially in our digital era, being able to hold still and see through the eyes of a photographer who has built a relationship with their subject and to imagine oneself in connection to that person in a way that's really different than the very fast moving digital world that we otherwise inhabit. So I, I wanna really just say that, I mean, maybe you wanna work this through and, and maybe it's just you who does this, but I do think that photographs are not only about the kind of capture of souls. On the contrary, I think that's the work of the information industries at the moment. I think in many ways, photography is a way to experience others through the relationship the photographer establishes with her subjects. I know, but okay, I'm not gonna argue with you here. Yeah, we, we'll do it later. You, you, they asked we'll about our later, relationship. But anyway. Well, that's I what I've been doing, you, Eileen. Thank you. No, no, I think both of you are making really good points. And I think photography has been a colonial tool and it has the potential to other. And it also has the potential to educate and embrace and, and be inclusive and expose kind of the way, it's kind of both and the way digital technology is that we, we thought it was gonna democratize information among other things, which it did. And it wasn't that great. Like the result has not been that great, but it's also enabled wonderful things to happen. So I think it's kind of getting control of ourselves. It's or... both. I'm not saying that what Fred, I'm not saying, yeah. I mean, it was so, I did hear the word subject. I mean, that comes from something, you know what I mean? So, I mean, I think that we, it, it's both, Fred. It, it has done all that good stuff, but it's like, the country, it's not like we're throwing the baby out with the bathwater to look at the whole picture of it. There's been too much damage done to not name it now and to let it keep spooling out without. No, that's very fair. And for the audience, I think we're also, Mary Beth and I are coming from different places on this, not just analytically, but also in relation to media. The fight that I'm in is a fight against the informationalization of everything. And, and you know, the colonial is power- is, in, is, is intimacy. The photography represents a kind of intimacy is what you're saying. Is that right? Well, as just, as well, let me, let me go a little bit further. Give, give me a little space. Um, this, is a, this, is, this is how we work together, by the way, everybody. But, but, you know, I think that digitization transforms our behavior into signals that literally abstract it from us and remarket it elsewhere. And, and it's really the classic move that photography might have made in the 19th century in, in certain settings. I think that um, by nature of the kind of collaboration that you've done with the people that you've worked with, um, you know, that you've, you've created a kind of anti-abstracting force. And, yeah. and I think that's, that's the power of photography. That's one of the reasons I know that I wanted to work with a photographer on this book is because I do think of photography as distinct from informationalizing as an anti-abstracting, anti-colonial force at this particular moment. 
I appreciate that. And if, if I didn't believe in that somehow, we wouldn't be here with all these pictures on the wall. <laughs> I Although, when I was sitting in Ariella's class, let me tell you, I sat through her, I sat, she let me sit in on her what is colonialism class for a whole year. And I was ready to get up in the middle of the night and tear all my work to shreds because it's like mm -hmm. really, it really challenges you to think about your process. So anyway, no, I appreciate that, of course. Anyone else have a question? <laughs> yes. Uh, hello. Okay. Wonderful. Uh, <laughs> so in the beginning, you talked a lot about how your subjects were already open to tell their stories and things like that. I'm more curious in how you were able to get people to open and for them to trust you not only to tell their stories, but also to photograph them as well. So like, were there any challenges of people who were a little bit more uncomfortable with that? Thank you for your question. Um, sure. I mean, you know, there were plenty of people who didn't want to be photographed and those, you know, so we don't see those, those pictures. I mean, there was a guy when I first got there who was living out of his car in Mountain View, not far from, I can't remember his name, not far from Fred's house. And I talked to him, I saw him, I talked to him, I told him what I was doing. He said, yes. And I said, no. And I said, yes. And then he wasn't returning my calls. So, you know, I mean, not everybody um, not everybody wanted to be part of this and it, it does leave a person vulnerable. You know, I mean, that's a big, um, gift when someone agrees to go into this process and, and, and allow their image into this context, you know? Um, but sometimes, I mean, it's, it's so amazing. Everybody like to just talk to strangers and just say like Imelda, who's out here with the gladiolas and the, um, the pink, the pink. Imelda, I was coming out of the Airbnb where I live and I saw these two cleaning women coming out of the house across the street and they were speaking Spanish and I speak some Spanish. So I ran up to them and I said, um, hi, my name is Mary, you know, my spiel. My name is Mary Beth Mia. I mean, I, you know, my name is Mary Beth Mia. I'm doing this project on uh, Silicon Valley. Okay. Okay. Um, you know, would you be willing to talk to me about what life is like for you? Okay. Okay. She gave me her phone number. So I called her and we talked on the phone and then um, we made a date and she, she met me and I didn't know where she lived or how she lived or I didn't know anything about her life, but she just, I, I always, I do have a lot of faith. I do have a lot of faith that you knock on the door and unbelievable worlds open up. Like you don't have, you know, every person is a portal to an unbelievable world. You know that about your own selves. So, um, Imelda, she gave me this gas, she gave me the address. And when I looked it up, it was a gas station. And I said, is this right? And she said, yeah, I'm going to meet you. And so I, I went to the gas station where with Redwood City, it was nighttime and she comes running across the street and we, she tells me to follow her and she gets in the car and we go and we pull in a driveway and there's a little teeny trailer and the, there's a little teeny white house. And then there's a little teeny trailer. And she said, my friends live in that house and there were like three generations of people living in that house but I live here and so we went in the trailer and um you know I did the interview I do long interviews I mean I think once people are meeting you at the gas station and having you you know come back they're kind of in you know and I'm I try to be as 100% transparent as I can you know this is who I am this is what I'm interested in would you like to talk to me about your experience this is how it would be used uh, and then we set a date another day to go back and do the portrait. And then uh, she invited me, we, 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 I met a friend of hers and we, we had some meals while I was there. And I went back with the French book and saw her and um, she was living in an apartment after the French book was published in 2018. So it's like that, you know, Richard, the guy who's on the, the tower, a friend of mine was doing work with the union and she told me, uh, uh, well, she became a friend, but she was someone that I met. So sometimes I was stopping people on the street like Imelda. And sometimes I got invited to go to this union meeting and I get invited to the union meeting and Richard walks in and oh, he was like, he was so charismatic and he kind of was a little bit central casting with the hair and the cigarettes and everything. And he, he just, I just kind of loved him right away. And the whole time I sat through the meeting saying, please let this help, please make this guy say yes. If I ask him if I could photograph him. He reminded me of that the other night on the phone. Remember how you watched me the whole time? Cause I told him. <laughs> and so uh, he said, yes. And you know, so, so it's just like that. 
It's just like that. I have this concern. Yeah. Yeah. Well, sometimes there were people like Fred, remember? Um, oh, I can't remember her name now. Sometimes there were people who sort of, I mean, you know, it's important that each person in the book sort of come from a different pocket of the community and, you know, whose history is different, who, whose mm -hmm. socioeconomic and cultural background represents a different part of the community without pigeonholing them and turning them into a stereotype. So I'm always trying to balance someone's kind of like identity and history with who they are as an individual. Right. So it was important to us that it not be too heavily weighted one way or the other. So we, we just, it was sort of like, well, what's the best pictures, which were the best moments, like this moment with Cristobal in that crazy shed with the pink wall. It was so profound when I met him and saw that. And, you know, he and I are like screaming and jumping up and down, making that portrait. It was so loaded that moment. So there were just clear anchors of the book. I think there's something like 26 portraits. There's not that many. <laughs> your question and then you next. Hi, so you're displaying a lot of your work at Brown and potentially at Stanford. So I was wondering, since these are communities with a lot of younger audiences, especially ones that are generally very liberal and hyper aware of these issues, do you aspire to have your work placed in an area that would be more impactful towards change, like putting it in those communities with all those billionaires or maybe someplace yeah. in New York. Um, and Mary Beth, can, yeah. sorry, yeah. Can, I, can I answer this as well? Sure. Yeah, go ahead, you wanna answer? Oh, sure. So I, I can't see you questioner and I'm sorry about that. I wish I could, but um, I, so I wanna, I wanna take issue with the, the, uh, the, the sense that the communities um, at these institutions are pr predominantly liberal. That may be true, um, it's certainly at Brown where I went and is true for a large portion of the Stanford student body. Um, but one of the virtues of doing this kind of work at Stanford is that the billionaires are here. I mean, I was in a meeting with Reed Hoffman five days ago. The, they are seeing this work, this work is traveling. Um, this work has had an enormous impact in Silicon Valley. I, I've been completely surprised, for example, to see that on LinkedIn, uh, local executives are circulating word of the book. I never thought of LinkedIn as a book promotional medium so, so I, I, what I want to say is that sometimes, um, even through super elite institutions, you can have impacts that extend far beyond those institutions to communities that may have only a limited presence on campus. That's all I wanted to say. Thanks. Well, I just want to address one part of your question, which is, you know, in projects before now, I, I, exactly to your point and to your, I think what you're getting at in terms of effectiveness, I've done the installations in the communities where the people live. So that's where the impact has been, that there's been that resonance. Um, and this one is kind of weird, like, you know, without, this is the first time I've, we've seen these as banners. Um, and the goal was to put it at Watson and at Brown, where those of you who are thinking about all these issues could address them. But I agree with you. I mean, to put these somewhere on the Facebook campus, but then does Facebook get to say they care about Cristobal? Like, I don't know. It's all so morally ambiguous. So I hear your point and I don't, we don't have a good answer for that yet, but maybe it's technology. Maybe it's this electronic billboard thing. Maybe that's what we do along 101. Mary Beth, can I say something also that you said to me, which I think is really important. You yeah. know, you, you, you've talked to me about how, you know, I, I've talked about how these folks are invisible in the mythology and you've reminded me that they are very visible to one another and to their own families and to their own lives. And one of the things that I'm proudest of with our project is that we have made them visible I think, or at least available to be visible to precisely the billionaires and folks who have not been seeing them and not felt responsible to them. You know, when the New York Times did a feature on this and published, you know, two full pages of our work, 24 images, they published it in the business section. Yeah, and I, 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 that's cool. the first time I can think of that the business section devoted two whole pages to the working class. I'm enormously proud of that. As you should be. Yes, please. Yeah, I guess speaking a little toward the, uh, um, idea of talking to Facebook. Um, some of the recent re re revelations yeah. that's come out this past week, I was shocked by some of the facts of the global impact of Facebook. And seeing as we're in the Watson here today, um, I was wondering um, what might you speak to like the further work that needs to be done in giving voice to like the 90% of users, Facebook users that aren't in the United States and like 
the those are the people that are seeing the disproportionate impact of you know the the workers in the um, administration of Facebook and the yeah. creation of it being inherently English speaking and um, biased toward like the their data being extracted here in the United States. Yeah. I mean, that's an amazing question. And Fred and I have talked about, um, I mean, people have asked us to do sort of the follow-up in which we talk about not so much the users as, as you're saying, but like say, take a, take a phone and what are the communities in Asia with no environmental protections like the ones that were put in place after Mark you know, was born? Um, what are the communities, the assembly, the disassembly, the, the, um, the data farms, what do you call them, Fred? The uh, so server farms. The server from so yeah do you want to talk about that a little bit we have oh, talked sure. about what is the international yeah. version of this book yeah it's a great question a really important one and i think you're pointing to the, the questioner is pointing to issues of globalization that the internet has actually raised how do we regulate and govern a world that has gone global and lives in cyberspace when our governance systems are right. built around geographically specific arenas and the control of land so you know facebook and apple can abuse workers in China, but you know the law in America can't reach those workers because they're right. behind Chinese walls and, and vice versa. I think that's an enormous challenge and we, we simply haven't got it figured out yet. And inside Facebook, there's a lot of work to try to figure that out, but it's understaffed, it's, it's happening haphazardly in all the ways that the, the revelations have recently suggested. But I think that that's a deep problem and one that an institute like Watson is uniquely you know, prepared to be thinking about. And I, I challenge those of you in the room who are in your 20s who are going into government later to, 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 ch to ask the question, how can the things that we do in our governance processes have global impact? Thank you. Thank you for the question. Paul, did you have a question? No, you were just saying hi. Oh. Paul, did you have a question? No. <laughs> well, no, I mean, okay. And this will be our last question, I think, because Oh, yep. So, um, Fred, I think this is for you. You mentioned that uh, in your ideal world, you would be able to put certain things up on the trademark buildings at Stanford. My first question, and I'll have a follow-up, is what what would what would you want to put up there? Mm -hmm. and the second my, question. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Sure. So there are two things I'd like to put up there. Uh, you know. I would really love to see Mary Beth's work and the work of comparable photographers on the walls of an institution that is building the world that those photographs represent. I, th I think it's really important to bring inside the walls of Stanford. The Stanford campus is very beautiful. Unlike the Brown campus, it's not integrated into town at all. It's, it's almost walled in. It's, it's, we are our own town. We have our own sheriff's department. We are the largest landmass of any American campus. And so it, it, it's a little bit walled off and I would like to bring the world in. The other thing I would like to do, frankly, is see lots and lots of student posters on the walls. Um, student postering here at Stanford is regulated and um, it's only done on approved kiosks, which makes for a very clean environment, but also one in which um, it's very difficult to sort of get things stirred up. One of the things I loved about Brown is, you know, you go, at least when I was there, you go everywhere, posters everywhere. So I'd like to see two things, beautiful large format photographs and lots of small, messy, crinkly posters. So to me, that doesn't sound like a university. Where really? there should be where there should be free speech and where people should be able to really right. yeah. demonstrate things visually, not only right. Yep. So I, I guess even the grass and the trees perhaps are, are trademarked there too. <laughs> the palm trees. Well, it's it, so so I don't know about the, the palm oval. trees particularly. I mean, I, I think this is a challenge, uh, you know, and I think there's a there's a debate here at Stanford as there is at many American universities about how what a university should be, how containers for free speech should be built, you know. I, I, I've spent a fair amount of time at Harvard and, and that's a world where some parts of the university and the undergraduate space are chaotic and open and flexible and the business school is not. And that's a challenge for us here at Stanford, I think, is to be a school in the middle of an extraordinarily wealthy industry driving global change and yet being a full university devoted to open speech, challenging ideas, political conflict, all the things that, that make a society free. And I think, right. I think it's a challenge that we're trying to figure out. Uh, last thing, I guess, then follow up. Our, our, our students uh, who would like to see a little more flexibility in terms of uh, the things you're just talking about, mm -hmm. are they uh, actively trying to uh, loosen up the, the university a bit? 
I think there's a, a there's certainly a strong activist community here on campus. Um, I think one of the things that's that's really different culturally than than Brown, and I'll have to use my own experience for this, is how people think change ought to get made. When I was at Brown, the coolest thing you could be as an undergraduate was a poet, um, maybe a musician. And lots of folks did that. And it was great. And we felt very creative and we did different things. And it was wonderful. I was able to do a book of poems as my senior thesis. It was delightful. Out here uh, at Stanford, the most creative students feel strongly that what they want to create are their own startups. And that the best way to change the world is to build a small company around an idea. And that ideology really permeates the place. And I think in the face of that ideology, it's particularly challenging for students who have other interests, who want to be poets, artists, photographers, to find the encouragement and space and community they need. So that's something that we're actively building here. And, and there's a lot of work going on kind of behind the scenes to build that community and sustain it. Thank you. Sure, thank you. Great questions, really appreciate them. I, I think that that's our last question. Mary Beth wants to say something, but I just want to invite everybody outside to a reception and we can all continue to discuss these things. I just really want to thank Ed Steinfeld and the Watson and Sarah Baldwin and Stephen Bloomfield who worked since, guess when, 2018 to, to put these pictures on the walls. This has been a long undertaking. We didn't know if we would ever get there. So I really appreciate it with an enormous, a, a huge team from facilities to art to architecture. So I just really want to thank everybody for getting it done. And um, I can't wait to be here for the next couple of weeks. And I guess I should publicly apologize to Fred for my family and man crack. So oh. that's it. <laughs> thank, thank you, you all, all for coming so much. And Fred and Mary Beth, thank, thank you so much. Thank you.